America has a housing crisis. That's not news. It's something we're all familiar with at this point. But what's interesting to me is how the response has differed state by state. In some states, there's been great success, and in some states, there's been a failure to pass any meaningful housing legislation. And it's not clear to me what's causing some states to succeed and some states to fail. It's not obvious partisanship. There are Democratic states passing important housing laws, and there are Democratic states where housing bills get trashed and left on the cutting room floor. Likewise, there are Republican governors who claim that upzoning is a woke agenda that will destroy your suburbs, but there are other Republican governors pushing really important housing bills and leading the charge for yimbyism. That's why we're introducing a new series about state-level yimbyism. I want to examine what's going on in the different states across America, which states are learning the lessons they need to learn, and how we can apply those in different states. We're going to be looking at many, many different states across the country, Republican-held states, Democratic-held states, and figuring out what works and what doesn't. The first state in this series will be California. Joining me today is Ned Reznikov, who is the policy director for California YIMBY. We're going to talk about what California does right, what California did wrong, and what lessons they had to learn, how the YIMBY movement has started to succeed there, and what other states can learn from California's experience. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, please support us. Please like, subscribe, mention us on social media. And if you really like the podcast, then you can support us by going to patreon.com slash neoliberal podcast. We appreciate your support. You can also become a member of the Center for New Liberalism at cnliberalism.org slash become a member. Thanks for listening and enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Neoliberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and joining me today is Ned Resnikov. Ned, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So we're talking about California today and the housing crisis in California and what's being done to address it. And I think the first thing we should do is just a little bit of history, kind of the cliff notes on where is California right now and how did they get there? So what can you tell me about how people first started to become aware of the housing crisis in California and when the effort from, you know, whether you want to call it the YIMBY movement or the pro-housing movement, however you personally would like to label it is fine. But when did that effort start and like how did that grow and become more serious over time? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, housing costs have been elevated in California for quite some time, but I think things really came to a head in, in particular, the Bay Area around the time of the uh, second tech boom, when all of a sudden you had this large population influx into San Francisco. And obviously for a variety of reasons and due to a variety of, of land use rules that we can maybe get into later, but I'm sure your your uh, listeners are already familiar with, uh, San Francisco was not expanding its housing stock at the same time as uh, population pressures were increasing fairly dramatically. And uh, I there was a, a sort of coalition, I think, between um, people who had lived in the area all their lives and were seeing what was happening, but then also uh, newcomers, places, uh, people from places that were a little bit less expensive, who saw what was happening in San Francisco and and California more generally, and were really appalled by it. And so, starting somewhere in the uh, the mid 2010s, a small group of them started going to uh, planning meetings in San Francisco to speak on behalf of projects because they noticed that uh, 
uh, when those projects uh, went up for review and, um, you know, uh, pretty much all the projects were subject to discretionary review, which means that they um, uh, can be dismissed for whatever reason public officials choose. Um, they noticed that the same small group of NIMBYs were, were going there to oppose projects and that there was no real counterbalance on the uh, pro-housing side. And so that was really the genesis of, of YIMBYism, was just uh, uh, dedicated activists using their, their spare time to show up to these uh, city planning meetings and say, actually, we want more housing. So that happens, you know, and, and tech is obviously booming in San Francisco. It's an integral part of the story of San Francisco. And the first Yimby movement starts to coalesce. My view of kind of how a lot of this works is that you kind of have to fail before you succeed in most places. It, maybe that's not a universally true thing, but I think for many political movements and for many Yimby movements in particular, you have to fail before you succeed. And I'm curious if that was the case in California, that for a long time you were just, you know, failing, running your head against a wall, accomplishing nothing, and it felt really frustrating. Is that accurate for California, or were there immediate successes, or did you basically have to learn what you were doing along the way? Yeah, well, I should I should preface this by saying that um, I am I am something of a, a latecomer or a bandwagoner to Yimbyism. Um, I didn't start getting really involved until the the last couple of years, so uh, I can't I can't speak too much to the early history of what was going on in the inside. But it I I will note that I, I think actually there there were some pretty dramatic early successes that uh, really. That that really helped fuel things. I, I I think just having that sort of public visibility, but also kind of filling a space that had not previously been occupied was was really important. And I'll say that um, the the model of uh, having public failures strategically, I think, actually worked to Yimbyism's advantage really well. So, for example. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, a really, uh, really huge bill called SB 50 um, that was going to be a, a pretty significant, uh, effectively statewide upzoning. And uh, this bill was I, being... I remember the fights around this. They oh, were yeah. Legendary. Yeah. Legendary fights. But this this bill was being proposed at the same time as what seemed like a, a, a series of more anodyne technical adjustments to accessory dwelling unit law. And so if, if I think, I think the big dramatic bills are great, but they also draw a ton of fire. And uh, in this case, it drew so much fire that I, I think actually the ADU laws were able to sort of coast by under, under the cover of all of the, all of the drama around SB 50. Uh, it, so I think I think those sorts of big uh, symbolic, not symbolic, the, those those really dramatic bills where it's like, oh, if we pass this, we'll have gotten a third of the way or half of the way or three quarters of the way to to solving the housing crisis are are important. They're they're really great for mobilization. And I mean, if you can get one passed, obviously, that's amazing. But but also they. uh are something that you can learn from and also something that you can adopt pieces from and pass those pieces in the future. But the other thing they do is they just draw a lot of fire for when you have some other things that are a little bit a little bit less dramatic sounding, but can still have as as uh, the ADU reforms have had a, a significant impact on housing production. I might be incorrect here and feel free to correct me if I am, but didn't SB 50 basically pass the the next year anyway a, under a different name like but most of the provisions of SB 50 became law in a year or two later even though SB 50 itself failed. Some of them did and I I would have to go back and uh look at the the exact legislative history there. Um yeah, it's a, I mean, 
Unfortunately, this is this is a little bit of a, a gap in my knowledge because I wasn't working at, at California EMB at the time. Perfectly understandable. But, you know, I, I think it's just interesting how this process can play out, you know, failure to success like we're talking about. And part of the reason maybe I just want to believe this because we do see other states are, are having pretty dramatic failures. And I'd love to ask you about what do you think the factors are that have led to some of the success in California? Because California is a Democrat dominated state. You know, everything is controlled by the Democratic Party. And really, the political fights happen as mostly, you know, different wings of the Democratic Party kind of struggling with each other. And even other states that are like that, for instance, where I live in New York, had a big housing bill come through that basically just died. And and not in the fun way where you get to pass ADUs, you know, on the down low, but m more just it, it was pretty much killed dead. And in, in Colorado, just this week, as we're recording, uh, Governor Jared Polis had proposed a, a very good sweeping housing bill that basically was killed. And so I look at this and I see, you know, in, in some places, Democrats are seemingly succeeding and, and in some places they're not. So I guess I would ask first, do you think it's accurate to say that, you know, California Yimbies are succeeding? And I know you work for California Yimbies, so <laughs> maybe that's a loaded question. But two, how do you see the successes happening and, and what's causing them and, and what differentiates California from places like Colorado or New York? Yeah, well, um, to your first question, Yes, I, I do think that YIMBYs are making progress in California. It is not happening as quickly as I think anyone would like. Uh, it's going to take years to dig our way out of this hole. And in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of additional suffering, a lot of homelessness, a lot of displacement. But we are in pushing as hard as we can. We We are slowly getting there and we just need to keep pushing. To the question of what makes California different from some other blue states that have have struggled more to to pass even even just modest uh, land use reforms, I, I think about this question a lot, and I think there are a few factors. Um, the first the first factor I'd point to is just the severity of the California housing crisis and the distribution of it. Because obviously, uh, housing prices in New York City are uh, just just unacceptably high right now. And I think in, in some ways, the affordability crisis there has gotten worse than even in the Bay Area. But the the housing crisis is is fairly concentrated in New York. So you have you have the city itself. You have some of the, the outlying suburbs and the uh, upstate communities where a lot of higher income people uh, fled during the pandemic. But a city like Buffalo, for example, doesn't necessarily have the same uh, severe cost pressures. Uh, those sorts of more um, rust belt cities that have been losing population. On the other hand, in, in California, the housing crisis is just about everywhere. Uh, the Bay Area, Sacramento, Central Valley, uh, Southern California, Central Coast, North Coast. I mean, it's it's really a, a statewide problem. So I, I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is that um, California, for all of the issues I have with the structure of governance here, with the the ballot measure system, the sort of fragmented hyperfederalism, all, all of that. I do, I do think that governance in California is generally better than it is in in many other states, and I think in particular a place like like New York. Um, California has a, a more robust administrative bureaucracy that's that's uh, just more effective and and has uh, more you know, more hardworking, uh, you know, re reasonably well compensated people. I'm very interested in this point because maybe it's true, but I think a lot of people who don't live in California, 
would be surprised to hear someone say, oh, actually, California is like very well governed, very well run. <laughs> and may, may, maybe that's unfair. Maybe there's a stereotype. But I do think people would be surprised by you saying that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that it doesn't have its problems, but I I, I think, you know, the fact that it, it has a pretty um, – a pretty robust administrative apparatus relative to other states. And again, this is all relative. I, I, I'm not saying that uh, California is... is. Uh, yeah, when uh, you say it's better than New York, by the way, you're clearing a very low bar as, <laughs> as a New Yorker. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm not I'm not saying that uh, that California is equivalent to, to Denmark or anything like that. But um, I, think, I think the other thing is it matters a lot that California has a full-time legislature that you have a sort of uh, professionalized class of elected officials. So uh, these are these are people who tend to be uh, more uh, high information, have more staff, just kind of are, are following and thinking about these issues more. And I was thinking about this a lot, in particular, when uh, the housing reforms that were proposed in, in Arizona failed, because it was clear to me that some of the NIMBY opposition in the uh, Democratic caucus in the in the Arizona legislature just had never actually really thought about land use issues before and were just uh, kind of reacting to whatever the League of Cities told them was the case. And, you know, it's not that everyone in in uh, the California legislature is a YIMBY or that I agree with everyone's diagnosis, but I do think there's something about the fact that both their their full time politicians with full time staff and house and also housing has been salient for so long that people actually have fairly developed views about these questions and know and know what uh, questions to ask. Yeah, that that point about you know they've had time to develop their views strikes me as a potentially important one, and part of me wonders if just you know well California had the housing crisis first. And so, of course, they're going to be a little bit earlier than some other states to address it because, well, just these things take time. You know, they flailed around for a little while and they had some failures, but now they're starting to have some successes. I wonder if it's just as simple as that, as, you know, California YIMBY is one of the strongest YIMBY organizations in the country because it's been around the longest. Do you think there's something to that, that it, in the end, maybe this just takes time? I think there's an element of that. And I, I think that certainly Yibbies in California have uh, something of a first mover advantage in that really this was, I think, the first state where there was really significant Yimby organizing. I think also there are certain tactical things that are are pretty important. I mean, when I the the picture I just painted there makes it sound like it's all structural factors that uh, YIMBY activists in other states don't have any any agency over. And that that would be pretty grim if that were the case. I, I, I think that there are important strategic choices that YIMBYs in California have made that have uh, aided in success. I think one is just having incredible legislative champions in, uh, especially in the state legislature, but also in, at the local level. So, I mean, in the legislature, the fact that uh, we've got Scott Weiner, Nancy Skinner, Buffy Wicks, I mean, it, it's just been an incredibly uh, valuable asset to, to have these really strong champions in the legislature. So I think electing great people is really important. Part of me does wonder, it, is a lot of this just contingent, you know, on if Scott Weiner doesn't exist, like... God forbid, but Scott Weiner 10 years ago had gotten hit by a bus and he never gets elected, right? Where would California housing be right now? Would any of these bills have been passed? Like maybe, but like I could see kind of the great man theory that like, you know, this is all contingent on one or two people. And, you know, you really just have to have either a pro housing governor or one or two really active legislators, which, uh, you know, is a little discouraging in the fact that like, if you don't have that person, maybe it feels impossible, but is encouraging in the fact that you can get that person in. That's something you can work towards. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that in some ways, uh, I mean, obviously uh, Scott Weiner is a, is a unique figure and I mean, it's all contingent, right? Because like if, if 
Sonia Trous hadn't shown up to planning commission meetings to speak in favor of more housing. I mean, what would the YIMBY movement exist in, in anything like its current form? I think it, I think it's hard to say, but I do think to your point, there are incredibly talented, driven YIMBY activists in virtually every state. And I've I've now interacted with with a lot of them from all over the country. And I I, I, I have to say I'm really um pretty pretty staggered and and inspired by the number of just incredible people who I've I've encountered all over the country working on this issue. Um and I, I, I think that's really that's really important. And and you know if you're if you're a YMB activist listening to this and you're considering running for local office, um, maybe you should. I, I'd like to encourage you to do that. I think the other thing is just um, having having information and making yourself useful to potentially uh, potentially sympathetic elected officials, understanding how power operates in the legislature, uh, making sure that you are there with the the sort of data and context that that people need to make informed decisions and that they feel they can trust you. And I, 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 trust is is the last thing that I'd really emphasize here, which is that YIMBYs are gaining gaining power in a lot of places, but they're still they're still small actors. I mean, even even California YIMBY, which I think is one of the the larger, if not the the largest, organizations working at the the state level on these issues is is tiny when compared to the League of Cities or you know the Chamber of Commerce or or any of the other uh, uh, lobbying or, or advocacy groups operating in in this space or related spaces, and so you really don't have the luxury of making people feel like they can't trust you. And that and that's why it's really important to make sure that you you're transparent in your um about why you're making certain decisions and also that you are only providing accurate double checked triple checked information that you're not you're not misleading people about the content of of legislation especially not misleading elected officials. I think I think that trust element is is super important, and I, I think, fortunately, um, I mean the 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 side we're on is the side that the the, the weight of the evidence actually supports, so it, it makes it a little bit easier. Trust is definitely an interesting factor, especially with some of the accusations that can be thrown at Yimbies that you're just trying to gentrify everything, you're trying to ruin our town. What about the town's character? Blah blah blah. I, I think. Because of the fact that that stuff gets thrown around, it is important to have trust. I'm really interested, though, in the political dynamics specific to California. And and this is obviously something that varies state to state. The lessons for California here might be applicable to some states. They might not be applicable to other states. But, you know, California, it's funny. I was going to say politics in California rotates, but, you know, the the centers of power go between moderate Democrats and and progressive Democrats, but part of me thinks it's really more like progressive Democrats and really extremely, extremely progressive Democrats. But I'm curious how you see kind of the, the work of convincing state senators and state legislators in in light of the fact that California is such a one party state. And, you know, it, it doesn't seem like there's a clear ideological line. Like I could imagine, and I know of the very, very progressive camp where they're, you know, super Yimby, they're super into building housing. Scott Weiner would definitely fall into this camp, I think. But there's also some, you know, who are heavily tilted towards the left who are not into building housing and are pretty much have staked themselves out as enemies of housing. And similarly, you know, on, on the more moderate side, you know, you could think about like neoliberal Democrats are, are very, very pro housing and it almost definitionally YIMBY. But there's also a kind of a form of moderate Democrat that that may be more like suburban. You know, I want to protect my suburban community. And so it's interesting to me that it doesn't fall in, into neat categorizations. And I'm curious how 
you see the work that you're doing as like balancing different ideological factions within the work that you have to do. Yeah, well, I think fortunately, housing is is probably one of the the last issues of national salience that is that is cross cutting across partisan boundaries. So there are people who, you know, as as you said, identify as as members of the left who are uh, pro housing, and there are people who identify as members of the right who are pro housing, and and so I think. I think that cross-cutting nature of it, which allows both a place like California and a place like Montana to separately pass EMB legislation is really important. And one of the things I'm concerned about is what happens if if that goes away. To, to speak more specifically to the California dynamic, though, uh, there are, in fact, Republicans in, in California. I think, I think actually one of the, the really fascinating things about California is that as much as it's, uh, you know, in some ways a, a, a national bastion of, of progressivism, it's also a national bastion of, of the right. Uh, you know, you, we have the, the Claremont Institute here. Uh, Andrew Breitbart and, and Ben Shapiro are from California. Kevin um, McCarthy, right? Kevin, Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, exactly. Well, and so I guess on a state level, just to ask a very simple question in the state legislature, do you even have to care what Republicans think? Or it, maybe that's a no because there's they're not in the majority. Or maybe it's a yes because if the Democrats are ever divided, it's really important that you get the Republican votes. Like, do, do you worry about that? We have to care for sure. Um, I mean, Republicans are a, a very small share of the of the legislature. Um, but I, actually, this, this is something else I wanted to say, which is that, you know, there's a common poli sci folk wisdom that divided government is good for bipartisanship. And what we've seen in practice is it's actually very bad for bipartisanship because if uh, undermining the uh, dominant party's agenda is the thing that could easily flip the legislature for you next cycle, then that's a that's a really powerful disincentive to cooperate. But in the California legislature where where Republicans are in the minority by a significant margin and, um, you know, on a, a certain time scale, maybe in sort of a permanent minority, uh, they have they have more incentive to cooperate because, you know, that's that's how they that's how they get policies that that they're interested in passed. And so I think it is important to to reach out across party lines um, in 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 any state, really, uh, in, in in any state where people are trying to pass EMB legislation, because there will certainly be members of both parties who are sympathetic to the the need for land use reforms to get more housing built. And in California, when we've had to pass things with some some fairly narrow margins, uh, with with SB nine, for example, which effectively ended single family only zoning in in California. Uh, we needed Republican votes to get that passed. And then to return to kind of the original question, do you find it difficult at times to kind of balance between the Democratic factions where you might have to satisfy a, a group that wants more progressive language or more progressive goals? You know, maybe they are focused more heavily on uh, affordable housing construction, for instance, or rent control inclusion or things like that versus a group that, you know, of Democrats that is is not as inclined towards those things. How do you kind of weigh the calculus of like what things to include? How do you balance between different factions and try to make everyone happy? What is your experience like there? And like, you know, if you were giving advice to some other Democrat dominated state, how is the best way that you've had success in kind of working with those factions? Yeah, well, the, the funny thing about about Yimbyism is not only that it's cross cutting across party lines, but even within the Democratic Party, I would say where someone falls on the more moderate to the more progressive scale is not necessarily the best predictor of, of where they fall on on Yimbyism versus NIMBYism. So I, I think that that opens up a lot of different opportunities for uh, conversations and uh, 
I mean, for for me personally, and I think for for California EMB, the the most important thing in policy development is just to be is just to be guided by the evidence. I think that you know, well, uh, certainly, certainly incentives matter for elected officials, and I, I think people have plenty of, unfortunately, plenty of reasons to be a bit cynical about the the political process. Um, it's also true that if if you have a, a strong evidence based argument for a particular set of policies like that, that does persuade people, especially if uh, you're you're proven right in in hindsight when you get some initial policy victories, and so you know obviously there's a lot of uh, ideological positioning that happens in California around. Oh, are you a are you a prog or a mod? But I, I think when it comes to when it comes to land use, there's there's lots of ways to to think about this in a more in a more sophisticated way. And I think I think elected officials by and large are are sympathetic to that. So for for example, um moving the conversation away from oh, is rent control good or bad to well, what's what's the right way to design a rent control or a rent stabilization program so that we are uh, improving improving stability for tenants without having a a negative effect on housing production? And you know the 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 jury is still out on AB fourteen eighty two, which we passed a, a few years ago, um, because it's still a fairly new bill and and there's probably some work that needs to be done with uh enforcement but i think the the basic model of how rent stabilization was designed in that bill actually is a is a a, a good way to get get the benefits of rent stabilization without the drawbacks so it's it's just a matter of being really really intentional and being willing to get deep into the deep into the weeds on this stuff and is that kind of the advice that you would give to Yimby groups in other states? You know, I, I'm thinking if you were kind of going on your tour and talking to different states and and kind of the Yimby groups therein, and giving advice about like, look, here's what I've learned. You know, being in California and and watching what's happened here for a few years, here are the lessons you should take. Is that the main lesson? Is just you know you've got to be up on the details, you've got to be up on the evidence, you've got to design things well, or are there other like, you know, really impactful lessons that you think other states should learn from California? Yeah, I mean, I think the big ones are be guided by the evidence, but also be guided by your principles. I mean, have have the goal in mind, but be flexible and curious and open to different paths for getting there. And I think also that's where that's where political opportunism becomes really important because you can't necessarily control what opportunities are going to present themselves in the legislature. And you have to be nimble enough to be able to take advantage of those as they as they come along. And then uh, again, I think just the the trust factor and also knowing what levers you can pull is really important. I mean, the the ADU legislation. I think is a is a really important example because it was the sort of thing that that didn't provoke a ton of opposition at the time and and that's in part because it seemed you know a little a, a little boring quite frankly but uh but people were were far sighted enough on on the Yimby side to to understand oh if we actually get these little technical adjustments done that will that will do something positive and so I think also just knowing where knowing where points of points of leverage and and the uh areas of least resistance are is also really important and and the areas that are sort of ideologically cross-cutting in certain ways that can either um split the NIMBY coalition or unite strange bed bedfellows on the the YIMBY side. Are there any lessons that you've taken working in California from other states, from other places? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I, I'd say a few things there. First of all, uh, I've been really 
pretty amazed by some of the Yimby activism that has been going on in more red or purple states. So uh, Montana, obviously, Texas, North Carolina, Michigan. Um, I guess I guess Michigan is is maybe virtually a blue state at this point. But but the the, the fact that um, it seems like this is the sort of oh I, also another another great example. I mean, this is a blue part of a of a purple state, but Northern Virginia, what they've been doing there has been pretty amazing. So. I think just kind of the the recognition that, oh, this isn't just a, a Bay Area phenomenon or even just a California phenomenon, but this is something that really people are are able to do all over the country has been really um really an important lesson to take to heart. I think I think the other thing is I mean, there have been really interesting policy experiments in in other states that are always worth learning from. I mean, I've I've learned a lot from uh, the example of of Houston, Texas, and and their land use regime. I mean, they've they've been able to grow by uh, a significant amount, a much much faster growth than Los Angeles or or any other large city in California. And at the same time, um, I've done a pretty good job of of controlling housing costs. But I'd, I'd also point to some of the work that uh, Washington and Oregon have been doing in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, they've they've got some some policy ideas that I'd, I definitely would like to I'd like to poach. And uh, I think there's also something to be said for the way they've the way they've gone about it, where um, I think there can be a, a bunch of competing sort of. Uh, a, a, there, there are a number of tactics that you can use to pass legislation, and it's important not to get too wedded to any one of them. So, for well, example, so, what, yeah, I was going to ask, what have they done? What, what, what's the tactics that are different there? Yeah, well, so in in Minneapolis, uh, for example, you have this uh, this pretty ambitious push to override single family zoning, and it actually it actually worked. They did it. Um, I think I think actually another example, this is not from the United States, but I think it's still worth pointing to is is the pretty dramatic upzonings that have been happening in New Zealand. And so so like I said, I think it's important not to get wedded to any particular tactic. And so as as much as I was talking about the value of doing uh, fairly boring technical fixes, I think a lot of these other states and and international examples like New Zealand also should tell us that you can do something big and bold and and clean, not especially complicated, but that uh, both has a, a ton of uh, both both symbolic political value and also real substantive value. I do hope that the the Minnesota plan survives. I know that they've. Uh been actually having some problems because Minnesota environmental review laws, I think, have overturned their 2040 plan, uh, which is which is a whole nother uh, pet subject for this podcast. Uh, and I know you also care about reforming, uh, you know, environmental review laws as well. California's got CEQA that is uh, not very helpful sometimes. Yeah, you you could say it's not very helpful. Sometimes we've we've got some we've got some issues there. Just just some small issues with sequel. Just just a <laughs> couple details. <laughs> All right. Well, we're we're wrapping up soon here, but I want to ask the traditional final question that I always ask on this podcast, and that is, where should people go if they want to learn more? They're curious about the California housing crisis and what's being done about it, and and Yimbyism in California. Where could they go? This could be people to follow on Twitter. This could be a blog. This could be a book to read. Uh, anything that you think would be a good resource. Yeah. Well, uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> I mean, I, we, we love a good thorough answer, but. Uh... <laughs> okay. Well, um, let's see. As far as I'll start with, I'll start with journalism. I think at the national level. Jerusalem Demsis and Rachel Cohen have been doing really terrific work on on housing. Um, Absolutely love Jerusalem in particular. Ra Rachel's yeah. also good, but Jerusalem's like one of my favorites. And I, I know that she's been on on the pod, so uh, I'll I'll plug that episode as well while I'm at it. I also recommend following 
local journalism in California. In particular, I think the San Francisco Chronicle and the Los Angeles Times really have been doing pretty terrific reporting on the housing crisis. Um, I'm a Bay Area resident and a, a proud subscriber to the San Francisco Chronicle. So that's a that's a, a call to support your local paper, your local journalism in general. Uh, as far as books go, I mean, a few recent books that I thought were really excellent were um, obviously my colleague Nolan Gray's book on zoning arbitrary lines. Uh, Jenny Schutz at the Brookings Institute also has a, a great book out recently called Fixer Upper. And then, and then the last one I'll mention is uh, Shane Phillips, who's a, a professor in the planning department at UCLA, has a book called The Affordable City that is really sort of a, a Bible for me when uh, looking at for comprehensive accounts of, of all the things that we need to do, all the things we need to reform in California in order to make things truly affordable here. Uh, I can also cite a couple of history books. So there's... Um, yeah, some great some great books about Los Angeles are The Fragmented Metropolis, The Reluctant Metropolis, and City of Quartz. And then um, just for an all around primer on uh, the history of land use and housing in the United States, I I really love Crabgrass Frontier, which is really a, a history of the the suburbs in the United States, but especially in the uh, the back half really churns into a um, a beautiful account of just 20th century American housing policy in general. Um, and then while I'll at, while I'm at it, uh, for a book that's more on the the Bay Area and the the history of of housing politics up here, um, I recommend American Babylon, which is a a history of of Oakland. Um, and then last but but certainly not least. Uh, well, first of all, I, I got to also give a plug to uh, Nolan's terrific podcast, Abundance, uh, which is a, a California YMB production where uh, he interviews uh, housing experts, uh, you know, planners, policy people, uh, political scientists, journalists on, on the pod. Uh, we've, we've also had Jerusalem Demsis on once, and I, I guest hosted that episode. And then... Last but certainly not least, uh, people should go to caemb.org to learn more about California YIMBY. And I'll, I'll just give a, a brief plug for a report I recently authored that you can find on the website called um, Housing Abundance as a Condition for Ending Homelessness, which really examines what we need to do to not only end the, the housing crisis in California, but in particular, one of the the, one of the worst manifestations of the housing crisis in California, the uh, homelessness crisis. Yeah, I got uh, I got some flack on Twitter the other day for saying, you know, homelessness is is mostly just a housing issue. You know, it's not it's not like West Virginia doesn't have mentally ill people or or drug use, um, but what they do have is cheap housing, and that's why you see much less homelessness in places like you know the the rural parts of America. But that's neither here nor there. A lot of good resources in there. I have a lot of reading to do. Um, I, I want to say thank you one more time, uh, Ned Resnikov. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks. It was a pleasure.